is a webinar series sponsored by the World Resources Institute, Pew Center on Global Climate Change, and New America Foundation on designing a regional cap-and-trade program. This is the fifth webinar in the series, and uh, we invite you to join us for the remaining webinars that follow today. Next week, for example, we'll have uh, design elements and federal cap-and-trade programs is the subject of that webinar. Judy Greenwald of the Pew Center will moderate, and you'll have some very tough-to-get speakers for next week, including David McIntosh, who is Senator Lieberman's person on, and uh, one of the people behind the scenes on the Lieberman-Warner proposal, and Sue Sheraton from the Energy and Commerce Committee staff on the House side. So two very busy people, very, very great uh, that we could get them to come and speak to you next Tuesday. Uh, 11.30 Pacific and uh, 2.30 Eastern for that one. So we welcome you to join us on that. Today we have the cap-and-trade design issues in depth. Last week you heard from Brian McLean of US EPA, Denny Ellerman, and uh, John Hutchison from Ontario concerning some existing cap-and-trade programs for other than greenhouse gas greenhouse gases. Today we're moving into the greenhouse gases area and we have a couple of very, also very busy people, Peter Zapfel from the European Commission and Chris Sherry from New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. In fact, Peter is coming to us from Brussels where he works for the European Commission and it's uh, well into the evening Brussels time. So he'll be with us for the first hour. We're going to have him speak for about a 30 minutes to describe the EU program, and then we'll let you ask him questions for 30 minutes, and then we're going to let him uh, move on. I thought he would be going home to his family, but apparently he has more calls with the U.S. even after this, so we're very dedicated. Peter's up, so. Um, okay. The calls seem to have dropped off. Let me introduce Peter. Peter Zapfel is the European Union Emissions Trading System Coordinator for the European Commission. And the European Commission is the institution responsible for the design of the EU emissions trading scheme uh, and responsible for ensuring its proper implementation across Europe. Peter is responsible for economic assessment of climate policies, including the development and quantitative assessment of cost-effective strategies. During his tenure at the European Commission, Peter has worked in the Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs, the Directorate General for Environment, and he has represented the Commission in UN climate negotiation sessions. Um, Peter has also spent some time here in the U.S. He spent a year uh, on an exchange while he was a student in Vienna, Austria, where he's from, and then he has a degree, a master's degree from John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, um, spent two years in in uh, Cambridge doing that. So uh, they, you can't hear them clap, Peter, but I'm sure they're happy to have you <laughs> to have you here today. And I'll turn it over to you for your presentation. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Well, thanks, Franz, uh, for the kind words of introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. For me, it's good evening, but for some of you, it's the morning or early afternoon. Uh, I'm glad to be with you this afternoon, or morning or evening and give you, as Franz said, I'll give you a bit of an introduction of, of the world's uh, first and largest international carbon trading scheme, the EU ETS, as we call it, shorthand for the EU emission trading scheme. Uh, I'm going to structure my uh, contribution in three bits. Uh, first, I'm going to have a gen general observation, so kind of a quick brush. Then I go into a bit more into the rationale and in the design of the scheme, and then I'm going to finish off with a section of what we have learned so far uh, because we are not just about into going and we've just started the second phase of the implementation of our scheme. So uh, on to the general observations, uh, first bit of my contribution. And uh, hopefully the next slide going to pop up soon. Uh, why did we in Europe choose emission trading? Before we introduced our EU ETS, emission trading as an environmental policy instrument was not very well known on this continent in contrast to the knowledge and the practical experience you have in the United States with cap-and-trade programs. After the Kyoto Protocol was concluded more than 10 years ago, uh, we came back, our negotiators came back from Japan, and then we looked at it and said, well, in, in fact, emission trading is not bad. 
We have two things there. We have, on the one hand, uh, we have the environmental argument of it. We have the cap, the emissions cap, a quantifiable and quantified cap. And we also have the economic advantages of it. We get to the target, the environmental target, at least cost. You could a bit, uh, the way we communicated this to the public, it could be a bit, un, uh, bit uh, described with the sentence I have at the bottom of my slide. Well, normally people think you, people make money with, with, with uh, polluting the environment. Emission trading is, in fact, an instrument that turns around that logic. You can make money, you do your normal business logic is applied, but you make money with cleaning up the environment. So that's a bit how we, we sold the instrument to a European public, which was initially quite skeptical. So I think most of you who are into this, they very much notice what a cap-and-trade program is. I mentioned this before. The cap is the environmental flip side of it and the trade, the flexibility across uh, the European continent uh, in the case of the EU ETS is, is uh, what brings the economic uh, side of the coin, which makes it economically attractive. Uh, who takes part in our scheme? And all of this, as is in the second part, I will all of get into more details of all of this, explaining the design to you. We have some 11,500 individual installations, not companies, but individual in installations, industrial and power sector installations that fall under the scheme which are all the way from the power generating sectors to iron and steel, refinery, cement, pulp and paper. Uh, the emission allowances, the currency in the system, everybody can buy and sell those allowances. So there's absolutely no restriction who at any stage, any point in time can hold uh, such an allowance. Uh, the allowances are a virtual currency, as we are, I think, both in Europe and the U.S. very much used to, to electronic banking. So we have something like an ET bank. We have an electronic, the allowances only exist in electronic accounts in registries, and that's similar as it has been done or is done in many existing uh, EU cap-and-trade schemes. Uh, what is traded where? As I say, the currency that we are trading is the allowance. The allowance is good for one metric ton of carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, it's an important issue when we come about linking our transatlantic markets at some stage. Hopefully, we have one metric ton and not one imperial ton of carbon dioxide. Uh, the trading uh, of the allowance if the market as such is not regulated by our legal instrument, which is called a uh, directive in EU legal speak. Uh, trading takes place in a number of ways, directly between companies uh, with the help of market intermediaries or brokers over the counter. And there's also a couple of, of organized exchanges that have popped up across the continent, uh, in Amsterdam, Paris, Vienna, Leipzig, Oslo, and many places across the continent where you have organized exchanges that have, uh, brand, that have entered this market, this business of uh, the market for emission allowances. Uh, next slide. Taking a bit. Uh, Peter, for, this, for some reason, this slide did not upload on the website, so maybe okay. you can just speak it. it. They won't be able to see it. Yeah, I just had some nice pictures there about there's, uh, the market is now in operation for three years and there's lots of, of analysis. As I said, we don't regulate the market in terms of how the trading is going. We don't provide, we don't regulate which information, market information needs to be there. There's lots of people who have entered this business. Here you see, for example, a, a, sh a shot from a website of, of Point Carbon, which is one of the leading carbon market analysts in Europe who on a daily basis uh, a look at the uh, report at what's happening in the market. On the le right hand side, you see there's a daily price quote, the closing price of the allowances. Uh, so there's a lot of, of information that is provided to the market uh, by, without any uh, regular intervention on our side. So all of this works very well in the market as we have. A last bit of the introductory remarks how do those allowances get into the market? Again, details will follow. Most of it is going to the market free of charge. Uh, the key instrument we have created in our, in our legislation is the National Allocation Plan, shorthand NAPS. It's a, a word that has become very famous in Europe, the NAP. Uh, then we have some auctioning, but not a lot of it. And the detailed, uh, the detailed methods on how those allowances are handed out free of charge, they differ from country to country, from member state to member state across the European Union. So there is no, no one single way across Europe, and you see in the background uh, for you, I've, I've put this there, you see a map of Europe, and you see Europe is a very diverse place with lots of countries, lots of regions. It is even bigger now than what I have it here in the, back, in the background of my slide. So there's various ways uh, how from country to country how uh, allowances are given to individual sectors. So there's no single way how, for example, power plants uh, or any other, any other uh, sectors receive free allocation, free, uh, their free allowances. 
So then we go on to some more detailed provisions, uh, a bit more explaining the details. And first of all, the important thing you have to keep in mind is the institutional background of the European Union. Uh, while it might look like a, or sound a bit like the United States of America, the European Union, uh, it's institutionally a very different construct than the U.S. Uh, we are a European Union that consists of 27 member states, as we call them, which is comparable to your states, but institutionally it's not at all comparable to the, state, to the U.S. Uh, the center the, you're at the European Union level, Brussels, uh, has uh, much more limited powers uh, than uh, the center you have, you, have, you have, the powers you have on, on the President and Congress and so on. So you have a much stronger decentralized way normally, normally do legislation in, in many areas, including environmental legislation. The legal instrument we're working with is uh, the directive. And again, the directive, a uh, bit of a background, is a legal instrument that fixes uh, the objectives, but then it leaves the details on how those objectives are reached uh, to separate legal instruments that need to be passed in the 27 member states. So we have some, it, it gives a, a core framework, the general framework, but then for European Union directives, uh, for it to be implemented, it requires a, a, a separate national law, national emission trading law in all the 27 member states uh, to implement the directive, which again leads then to what I alluded to before, there's a differences in, in some differences in the way it is implemented. The EU ETS uh, operates in phases. Uh, we have just concluded our first phase. We started off with a three-year phase running from 2005 to 2007, and we, call, we, we, we called this phase the learning or the trial period because this, this is the first time not only at the continental level but also in any of the member states that we have actually implemented a, a market-based program that it sets that creates an environmental market. You know, you may know that Europe has a lot of tradition on environmental taxation, the other economic instrument, but uh, permit trading was not used really before we introduced the EU ETS. So that's why we saw this as a learning period to see actually how we can handle implementing this instrument. Now, in January, just a few days ago, we have uh, started our second phase. This is now uh, stretching. This is now for a five-year phase, and it goes in parallel with the five-year commitment period defined under the Kyoto Protocol. And beyond that, beyond that second phase, the directive is written in such a way that we would continue in consecutive five-year phases. However, and that's you're going to see this coming back in any slides. Now, we are currently in the process of reviewing. Uh, the, the rules uh, for that govern the EU ETS. So we're reviewing that legislative instrument. We're actually going to have a legislative proposal to amend uh, the directive out mid next week. Uh, all those rule changes will, however, only apply as of the third trading period, which starts in 2013. So on every slide, I also give you a bit of, of, an, of, a, of an outlook now uh, what you can expect, uh, what the EU ETS will be like, of course, still subject to a legislative process what the EU ETS will be like beyond uh, the second trading period. And we had a lot of debate, and most stakeholders want to see a stretching of the, of the trading period, the phase beyond the five years. So I expect that the phase length, uh, when we go into the third and further trading periods, will be extended beyond five years. The discussion goes, uh, we should have something like eight to ten years uh, that the future trading period should be defined for. That's for phasing. Uh, next point. Uh, who is covered by the EU ETS. Uh, in, in technical speak, the EU ETS is defined as a downstream system. That means the point of regulation is the installation, the industrial or power installation or the power plant is actually releasing the emissions into the atmosphere, which is in contrast to some of, of the proposals in the US which uh, suggest that uh, you have, should have a trading scheme upstream, so where you, where you regulate on the basis of the carbon content of a fuel but not of the actual emissions. We have chosen a downstream system. Uh, the main coverage we have is large stationary resources because of this downstream focus, as in the sectors I alluded to before, uh, plus uh, a number of combustion installations, which is a very generally defined term in our legislation, which also includes uh, categories of installations like chemical cracker, crackers, like drying equipment, heating equipment, and so on. Uh, notably, it does not cover road transport, because if you do it in a downstream fashion, the, the point of regulation would be the individual car. And at this, at this stage, it does not cover other greenhouse gas emissions than carbon dioxide, so none of the five other Kyoto gases. Uh, one footnote here, we are in the process of extending, uh, and, but this extension will not apply before 2011 or so. We are extending uh, the coverage uh, to the aviation sector 
which in, in other terms you can call them flying combustion installations. They are also combustion installations, but they're not stationary, so that extension is underway. Details are still to be fixed. There's a political consensus on extending to aviation, but details are still worked out. Uh, in total, so compared to, to other schemes where, where the notion is, and I think quite a few of the U.S. Uh, congressional carbon trading bills are based on the notion of an economy-wide trading program, the EU ETS is based on the notion of a downstream system. We have a more limited coverage. It's still a very, very big vehicle. It's, it's, it's a, major, a major policy, but we are at this stage cover some 40% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. In Europe, it still, as I, as I said before, makes it volume-wise the largest trading scheme operating anywhere in the world. And the asset value of the EU allowance is, is, is tremendous compared to anything that has been implemented before in terms of cap-and-trade schemes. Also, for example, compared to uh, the example in your country, the U.S. Uh, so to allowance market, the, the value of those allowances, the annual allowances created of the U.S. market is about a, a tenth or so of the value of EU allowances. Uh, what to expect in this uh, uh, ETS review for beyond 2012 that, that I alluded to before? Expect a limited extension of the scope, but just a limited one, uh, so no revolution in, in going you know, way beyond the 40% of the coverage we have now. Uh, but also another quite an active debate we had on the point many stakeholders made. Uh, there are some, as I said, the focus is large stationary sources. We will actually uh, create possibilities to remove some of the smaller installations where a number of stakeholders made the point it doesn't make sense to go down to two small installations in the coverage of your scheme because the benefits of in the scheme do not outweigh the costs, the fixed cost, so to say, that you have to be in the scheme. So there will be more added on the one side, but also the coverage will be reduced to some extent on the other side. But overall, the, the coverage will grow by a few percentage points. Uh, the key environmental variable, the cap setting, how is the, the emissions cap uh, determined in the EU ETS? Uh, in the initial two phases, we have, uh, based on, on the institutional background that I alluded to, the cap is set in, a, in quite a decentralized fashion. The EU cap is, in fact, the sum of 27 member state caps. So you have 27, uh, the 27 member states, they decide capital by no European national by national capital, how many allowances they want to issue into the European market. Uh, it is a cap within the cap because all those 27 member states, they have an emissions budget under the Kyoto Protocol, but because we are not an economy-wide program, it's a decision if, 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 a, if a member state is allowed per year 100 uh, units of emissions under the Kyoto Protocol, it has to decide how much of those emissions it wants to, to uh, give to the installations covered by the trading scheme and how much it needs for non-covered sources. So we have very much a bottom-up, uh, member state-driven process. We have so, some criteria defined in the directive, criteria, and then we have this, this, this uh, instrument which I alluded to before, the NEP, the National Allocation Plan, and that's actually where uh, individual member states uh, set the caps in the National Allocation Plan. However, we have not complete freedom for member states uh, to put as many allowances into the European market as they like to do, because we have those criteria and we also have an obligation on the European Commission, the institution that I am with, to scrutinize and approve those allocation plans. And we had in, in a number of cases, especially for the second trading period, we only approved those allocation plans uh, if, uh, uh, if uh, the, on the condition that the number of allowances was reduced. So next one. Uh, here are the numerical figures. The cap in the phase one, the annual cap was about 2.2 billion allowances, and the cap has already come down quite a bit in the second phase to 2.08 billion per year in 2008 to 2012. Take into account we have actually in the mean in the first period we had 25 member countries. In the second period we have now grown to 27 member countries. So it's the cut on the cap is more than what you numerically see here because we have two more member states, Romania and Bulgaria, included in our market. Uh, in the ETS review and for the setting of the cap uh, beyond 2012, expect a major a change to the way that the cap is set. We had a, a, we had a big consensus across Europe after two rounds of setting the cap in this decentralized fashion that this is not the optimal model. So from, we, we will go away from the bottom-up perspective of having the, the EU cap being a sum of 27 national decisions to something that is decided up front directly on a top-down fashion in the directive. 
which I think would align the, the EU ETS with, for, uh, with quite a few of the legislative acts you have in the U.S. where the caps were set directly in primary legislation. And also expect in phase three a significantly lower cap. Uh, still, you know, it will the 2.8 billion will shrink a lot further. If you are interested in the number, uh, I can't uh, 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 can't uh, put forward any figure at this stage. But by Wednesday next week, the figure that we would like to see the annual cap in the third trading period, you, you will see in the public domain when we make our proposal next week. Uh, do allocations. So once you've set the caps, the next question is how do you actually uh, hand out the allowances? Uh, in principle, the allocation uh, from, from procedurally is, is, is dealt with in the same way as the cap is set, namely also in this decentralized, via this decentralized process with the national allocation plans. And as much as the cap, the Commission is also scrutinizing the allocation. We have some levels some rules at European level, but some that this is uh, just giving a kind of a, a raw framework for it. Uh, in principle, the directive foresaw in both in the first and the second period that the majority of the allowances that each and every member state is creating and putting into the European market need to be given, a, uh, given away free of charge. Uh, the maximum that could be auctioned or sold was 5% of the member states total in the first period and actually in the second phase, 10%. Uh, we have uh, uh, a clear provision there that you could not give a free allocation for installations that are not covered by the EU ETS. So, for example, when you look at the power sector, when you have a nuclear power plant or a renewables uh, capacity or windmill, which do not actually emit any carbon dioxide emissions, also they are the power sector, because they do not fall under the directive as an in installation emitting greenhouse gases, they cannot be given any free allowances. But beyond those, those as I say, this broad framework, and there is not many further constraints beyond this, and there's a lot of freedom member state by member state to decide uh, how the how the allowances are actually shared out. So this has in practice resulted in 27 different ways of allocating allowances. So if you would have a similar installation, a similar type of power plant built, you know, operating in 27 member states, you can take it for granted that the, the absolute number of allowances of that plant would differ. You would have 27 different numbers. We have so some commonalities in the way that member states have gone, uh, uh, gone uh, about uh, allocating allowances, uh, namely that in principle the, uh, the allocations are more restrictive for power plants uh, than, and are more generous for other industrial installations, and that's related to the fact that power plants find it because they are not subject to, uh, to competition beyond the European continent. They find it very easy to price in the value of the free allowances, the cost pass through, uh, and uh, industrial installations are somewhat more exposed to international competition, steel sector, cement, and others. So that's why we have the general tendency of what be, some people call the power sector squeeze. So most of the scarcity, the shortage in the allocation plans is, is created by restrictive allocations to the power sector, and other installations are allocated closer to, to actual need. Uh, in the review, ongoing review of the rules of the ETS beyond 2012, again, as with the cap setting, expect major changes also with regard to allocation. Uh, expect a lot more of the, 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 the fine print to be determined at the European level. We call this more harmonization of the rules for free allocation. But uh, more importantly, even more importantly beyond that, expect a major change that will move away from the majority of the allowances uh, being having to be out allocated, given away by governments free of charge, we'll see, we will start a transition towards auctioning of allowances. There will be obliga obligatory auctioning as of the outset in 2013, and we will move over to uh, uh, the base, and the, the, how quick we go, to, how quick the transition goes is still uh, quite a lot discussed, uh, but we will basically, the ETS will transit over time to an, an, a scheme where all the allowances will be uh, auctioned. There will be no free allowances at some time in the future. We'll see when this will be, and you can, of course, expect there will be a lot of political debate and opinions will differ quite a bit how fast or how slow that transition should go. Uh, to the offset rules, I think that's where the EU ETS design differs quite radically from what is discussed in, in, in various uh, cap-and-trade uh, bills, in congressional draft bills, and also in, in the regional programs implemented. The EU ETS as such uh, does not create separate that has not created freestanding or separate offset institutions and rules. Uh, what we, however, do we piggyback on the offsets that are created under the Kyoto Protocol's project mechanisms, the Joint Implementation and CDM, uh, green, green Development Mechanisms, in shorthand, JI and CDM. 
there are some credits that are that are generated under the UN rules. And we basically, instead of creating our own offset infrastructure and rules, we basically allow recognizing our legislation those offsets subject to both qualitative and quantitative limitations. Uh, qualitative let, uh, impl- uh, limitations, we do not accept offsets that are generated, will be generated from building new nuclear power plants or from, from the enhancement of carbon sinks across the world. We have some limits in terms of, of, of uh, offsets we take from, uh, from hydropower plants. And we also have quantitative limitations uh, in order to what is called under the Kyoto Protocol to respect the supplementarity provision, which means it's part of the uh, significant part of, of the effort to cut your emissions needs to be done domestically in your own backyard. So we have a credit import limit in the second phase, which is roughly equates to some 13.5% of, of the phase two cap. And that is differentiated by member states. The individual member states have, uh, based on criteria, I don't want to go further into details here. If you're interested, I can. Uh, I can elaborate this, but we have this is different. The third and a half is not a flat rate for every member state and every installation, but it is further differentiated. Uh, in the review of the EU ETS uh, on offset rules, expect a continuation of the recognition of the project credits, again, but subject to maybe some, some changes of the qualitative and the quantitative limitations that we have. And do not expect that we will go into into great length into uh, the, uh, creating our own offset uh, European offset rules. We might have some progress in that regard, but not we're not going to do big things in that regard. Uh, next point on the design, monitoring, reporting, and verification. Uh, each installation of the over 11,000 installation is, is obliged each and every year to monitor and report its emissions. It has to produce this emissions report uh, by 31st of March in the year X plus one. Uh, this self-reporting is then subject to third-party independent verification and is based on EU-wide monitoring rules that are largely based on the calculation approach. So we're not using what, for example, you're using in various U.S. air pollutant trading schemes, continuous emission monitors on, at the smoke, at the, at the stack, uh, but we use calculation rules for fuel input uh, with uh, the carbon content of the fuels. In the ETS review, expect a strengthening of those rules on monitoring, reporting, and verification. It's a technical subject. If some of you are interested, we can go into further details, maybe even bilaterally, as, as I think it's uh, not a subject we normally receive a lot of questions on. Compliance and enforcement, which is, of course, at the heart of a successful carbon market. Uh, the rules in the EU ETS are written in such a way that each and every installation, the operator of each and every installation, has to surrender hand into the regulator allowances corresponding to its verified emissions by the 30th of April in year X plus one. So one month after the emissions report is handed in, uh, we have to surrender the allowances. Important to note here, the free allowances for the, for the year in X plus one are issued by the end of February. So whenever you have to hand in allowances, you have two years of, of free allowances in your hands. So you have a, a, a year-to-year borrowing provision worked into our rules. What happens if you do not surrender any, if you do not surrender sufficient number of allowances? Well, we have a financial penalties applying to it, which are 40 euros in phase one and 100 euros in phase two. I apologize, I didn't find uh, the time to convert this into U.S. dollars for you, but per ton of carb- carbon dioxide in U.S. dollars, I think, is about 60, 50, 50 to 60 dollars in phase one and some 120, 130 dollars in phase two. It's, it's, so it's a substantial financial sanction, which makes and a very strong incentive to respect the rules. And even if you pay the fine, you're not uh, you're not out of it. You still have the obligation to surrender the missing allowance. And then we also have the what we call the name and shame approach. All those companies who fail to hand in a sufficient number of allowances, their names will be published. Uh, linking at the global carbon market. Uh, well, we are the European Union, as we are the first mover in this. Uh, we are, we are regard ourselves, we very much perceive ourselves as the first mover in the evolution to a global carbon market. So we are the first, but but not the, not the only one in the end. Uh, we have worked into our rules right from the start, provisions that we can link our carbon trading scheme with other carbon trading schemes popping up across the world on the basis of a bilateral agreement. We had a first uh, new member joining us uh, in January this year, the European country Norway, which is part of, of the European continent, but not a, a member of the European Union. Uh, it has been integrated into the EU ETS via special arrangement, which is in EU legal speak as the economy, EEA, European Economic Area. But again, this is too much detail to bore you with. 
In the ETS review, expect that we will uh, relax some procedural constraints we have on linking. At this stage, we can only link to national schemes, schemes at a national level of countries, Annex 1 countries that have ratified the Kyoto Protocol, and we will relax that constraint in the future so that we all can also link to regional markets like uh, RECI, like California, and to markets in countries that have not ratified the Kyoto Protocol, like the United States. Uh, some a few other issues. Last slide on the design. Uh, we have banking is one of the design issues in a trading program. Banking of allowances into future phases is, as is unlimited as of the second phase forward. In phase one, so from phase one into phase two, basically from 2007 into 2008, it was at the discretion of individual member states, and almost all of the member states decided not to allow for it. Borrowing from future phases is not allowed and uh, free allowances can be held back and have traditionally been held back in so-called new entrance reserve for new entrance installations in basically all of the first and second period national allocation plans. So as the EU ETS is going into its second phase now, what has happened so far? Uh, the trial period or the learning period is over. Well, we had a very rich uh, learning experience. Uh, I think in the end uh, we have our conclusion is that the learning phase has proven that the EU, that our carbon market works. There are some things, of course, when you learn that things that can be improved, but in principle the instrument works very well, even at a continent-wide scale. We have been very successful in putting in place the necessary infrastructure uh, that you need for the operation of a cap-and-trade scheme, the monitoring infrastructure, the allowance registries, the electronic registries, all of those things, which are technical things, but they need to work. People only worry if they don't work. So all of these things have been put in place and they are performing. We have also, we have, uh, after only three years in the scheme, quite a liquid secondary market in allowances has developed. I'll have a bit more on this in a minute. Uh, we have, as I alluded to before, we have seen as the predominant way of handing out allowances for free. Uh, that is so still subject to change if we go beyond 2012. And I think one of the, the core lessons, uh, which I think that I would really, uh, I think, those of you which have started, uh, which have looked a bit into emission trading, you quickly come to that conclusion, but it's not only a conclusion conceptually, but also very much in practice. Cap setting and allocation uh, have proven to be very complex, uh, quite time-consuming, and rather controversial issues. So this is really at the heart of the successful uh, trading, of uh, designing and implementing a successful trading scheme is uh, having a robust cap in place and, and overcoming uh, all the political hurdles that one has to overcome in the allocation process. As I said, we have a liquid secondary market. Here you see from one of the leading market analysts uh, a chart which gives month by month since early 2005 the, the annual, the monthly trading volumes that are, uh, that are reported to be traded. It's not completely up to date. It stops in September last year. But what you see here, basically, you see a steady increase in the number of allowances that are traded per month. And we have now uh, an average trading volume of way beyond 100, of, of roughly 120 million allowances per, uh, per year. Uh, sorry, per month that are turned over in the market are each and every month. Here is the price development, of the, again from the same analyst, the chart that shows the de development of the allowance price over time. You in fact have two prices here because we didn't have banking between phase one and phase two. You see a blue chart which is charting the phase one price, and then you see a red chart which is charting the phase two price. The price for the allowance is now in the second phase. Uh, unfortunately, our market was oversupplied in the first period. And that's a longer story. I think I can, if, if one of you has a question, I can elaborate that uh, in more detail. But uh, you see a very sharp drop in the price in around April, uh, May 2006. And that's related to the fact that in April, May, and I, I, uh, I explained before, uh, in March 2000, by the end of March 2006, the first uh, emission reports, uh, verified emission reports, have to be handed in. And they are, in fact, made public, so that's what I mentioned before, not mentioned before, they are made public by the 15th of May. And so when the first emissions reports uh, were made public, and when we all started to realize that we, in fact, we had the cap that we have expected to be binding was by far not binding, and we, in fact, have over the phase a more, very likely an oversupplied market, we saw a very rapid drop in both the phase one and phase two price. Uh, you see how it, it, it really went in a free fall. But then what you see sometimes later, after two or three months, actually those two curves, the phase one price kept on going lower and lower, and now it's, it basically went to zero, because if there's too many allowances in the market, it shouldn't have a price. While the phase two price, when we started to assess uh, the allocation plans and started to work on 
fixing a much more robust cap for the second phase of the scheme. We have a stable uh, carbon price for the second uh, period now. We have a price that has been uh, for a long time in the, in, the, in the range of about 20 to 24 euros uh, per ton of CO2, which is over 30 dollars per ton of carbon dioxide. That's the market price we have seen now for a long time, and we have a robust market now overcome uh, the initial problem with, with two lakhs a cap. Uh, what will change uh, in the second phase, that's a summary here of, of, as I get to the end of, of, my, of my introduction, uh, that links nicely with what I said before, the phase two cap is much lower than the phase one cap, so we have now ensured a robust, and, uh, robust market with a sufficiently solid uh, carbon price. We've also made headways in terms of uh, overcoming uh, the complexity uh, of the allocation plans and allocation rules. So then in principle, also, there's more progress to be made. In principle, the way that L the free allowances are handed out, the rules that govern this are uh, much are somewhat simpler in the second period. We also have more auctioning in the second period. We had less than 1% of the cap was auctioned in phase one, and we're going to have some 3 to 4% of the cap will be handed out by auctions in phase two. We have already worked on some of the technical rules underpinning the scheme, so that the rule scheme, so the rules for monitoring, reporting, and verification (MRV), uh, those have already been reviewed and improved, so they start to apply as of as of January this year. We are, as I mentioned before, we are in, on the way of extending our scheme to aviation. That will come in sometimes towards the end of phase two, 2011, maybe only in 2012. Uh, because we had our learning experience, both the regulators and the regulated companies uh, have entered now a few weeks ago the second phase, very well prepared, really capitalizing on the experience from the learning phase. And by now, while there was initially a lot of resistance in the business sector, by now the fact that we have a carbon constraint has now in 2008 uh, become an accepted uh, reality on a daily basis for European business. So to conclude, uh, we have done a lot of work and it was a very busy process here in Europe, but I think in, and we have put in place with the EU ETS a functioning carbon market that is offering a model for others uh, who are uh, thinking about designing and implementing such a scheme and that is offering rich experience on both do's and don'ts for, to draw on for others. Uh, phase one has been a really, the first phase that just ended has been really a valuable learning experience, uh, but when you sometimes see media reports that the EU ETS isn't working, you need to look at it through the lens of phase one was not about to make big environmental headways. It was about to test the infrastructure. It was about to learn how we can operate an instrument in that, in that regard. It has been very successful. Phase two, as I just explained a minute ago, has uh, sees many improvements. And beyond that, in the ongoing review and also in the international process, how we go on with climate policy beyond 2012, the EU is fully committed to work towards a global carbon market based on robust and mandatory cap-and-trade schemes, and we are happy to collaborate with the rest of the world, with everybody who's interested to join us in this endeavor. So let me stop here. Uh, there's one more slide, which you see uh, two websites, uh, two web links, which on one hand is linked to our home page on climate policy, and then the specific uh, web page on the EU ETS that gives you a lot more uh, information. Uh, so, Franz, great to you. Thanks very much, Peter. Great and comprehensive talk. A lot of questions have come in in writing uh, while you were while you were speaking, and we'll begin to go through those momentarily. I want to also let those of you listening know that if you'd like to ask an oral question to Peter on your keypad to your phone, you type star one, and that'll put you in the queue to ask a, to ask a question orally. I'm going to go to the first question in writing for you, Peter. And it is from Spencer Reeder of Washington State uh, Department of Ecology. Since you allow anyone to hold allowances, have there have has an, a concern been expressed over the retirement of allowances, uh, thus resulting in more scarcity than originally intended? Uh, no, not very much. I, think, I mean, we don't have we don't have uh, good statistics on this. Uh, there is, of course, everybody can go and purchase allowances, but not too many people have done so. There's actually one thing that is explaining this. Uh, for opening an account, as I said, in principle, everybody can hold, account, uh, can hold allowances, but for physically being able to take possession and to retire them, one needs to have an active account in one of the... Our allowance registry has also 27. It's a hub-and-spoke system with 27 national registries. 
and opening such an account in a registry is subject to financial fees that keep away quite a few of, of, of individuals or, or environmental NGOs or others that would just go in, purchase five or ten allowances and, sur and surrender them. So we have some of those activities, but it has no discernible influence on the market, on the scarcity whatsoever. Okay. Next question is from Don Wolf. To what extent does ETS trading involve speculation or arbitrage on the market value of emissions allowances? Do emissions allowances ever go unused, for example, if a trader without an emissions source holds an allowance without selling it? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a question that can best be best uh, responded to by the market analysts. But I talk to them from time to time, so I try to give it a, give it a, a, give it an attempt as well. Uh, we not only have what what people in, in the analytical community call compliance traders, so those which have obligations under the scheme, but we quite have a, some quite some financial intermediaries, investment banks. Others are very active. Uh, they are basically seen as, as liquidity providers in the market. Uh, they are, however, not I mean, they, they are not taking out allowances in the market. They, they, they provide them. We have, in fact, because the way that our market has developed, we have uh, contracts. Uh, the most uh, busiest part of the market is not spot trading of allowances, but it's, in fact, forward trading. And when, when, you, go, when you look at uh, the, the daily information that's provided, you have a market for allowances delivered in, in December of each year. So now that we're in 2008, you have forward contracts for December 2008, December 2009, all the way to December 2012, delivery of allowances. So you have basically five segments of the market. Uh, having financials involved in this adds liquidity for some of the, some of the, win of the, of the, the years where there's not too much uh, trading. So... Uh, Financial intermediaries are very active, but there's, there's no negative perception on, on what uh, they rather seen as rendering value to the market and to the way that the market is operating. Next one, then. Okay, the next one is, what sort of third-party verification has emerged to verify validity of sellers of carbon offsets? Uh, that's a problem we didn't have to solve in Europe in the way that I explained it to you before. Is we don't have our own offset infrastructure. We basically piggyback on, on, on the whole process of generating uh, the credits under the UN framework, under the CDM executive board, so whatever comes out of that pipeline uh, goes through the UN infrastructure. If it fulfills our qualitative criteria and if it's within our quantitative limits, can be imported and used in the UETS. So that's a, a question uh, which needs to be posed to the, the people in the UN secretariat, climate secretariat, running the CDM and JI programs. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next, there are two. The next two questions involve CCX, Chicago Climate Exchange. If you know the answers, the first is how does the EU ETS compare in tons of CO2 traded with the CCX voluntary market? The second is, is this European organization involved with the CCX, and does your organization have any association with American corporations? Yes. Uh, first thing is, uh, without knowing the figures by heart, I think the EU ETS is. Uh, much more liquid in terms of the daily turnover than, than the CCX is. Uh, I showed you, I, I gave you the information on, on our monthly trading volume, so there's about 120 million. I don't think the CCX is turning over by anywhere close to 120 million uh, allowances a, a month. Uh, the CCX is a very different animal than the EU ETS because the CCX is a voluntary market. Ours is based on, on the BINT by legislation, a mandatory scheme. Uh, we, of course, we interact with CCXs with many stakeholders, but there's no, no formal affiliation uh, uh, that we have with the, CC, with the CCX. However, quite some of the EU companies with installations in Europe, uh, they are, for some of the installations they have in the US, they are, they are participating in the CCX, but I don't see this as a formal, formal link of, of any nature with the CCX. Next one, Franz. Okay, um, you have one question in the queue. I'm going to let that person ask it orally. Uh, just one second. Go ahead. Go ahead with your question. No, I'm sorry. Oh, you changed your mind? No, I read it. I, I write it. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so I'm back to the, back to the written, written questions here. Um, on slide 17, the cap appears to be declining, but does the cap include industrial emissions, which are outsourced from the EU ETS to uncapped 
quote-unquote emerging economies such as China, India, etc.? Uh, this is a question that refers to the phenomenon which I think is, is, is called in expert circles carbon leakage. <coughs> we, as, as I explained in our downstream focus, we cover installations that are operate in the territory of the European Union. In the context of the review of, of, of the rules of our scheme beyond 2012, there is, there is a debate to what extent we should also include uh, in our scheme importers of, of products uh, that are produced by similar installations outside Europe, but at this stage, uh, there is, uh, this is not covered. Uh, there's a lot of, of assessment done of the EU ETS to what extent, uh, because that's something that is, is claimed very often by industrial stakeholders in the debate, to what extent uh, the carbon constraint has uh, led to relocation of industry outside Europe. We are following this very carefully, but for the time being we have no, no, no compelling evidence that this has happened in the one or the other sector, that the installations have actually closed up shop and moved outside Europe for reasons of the EU ETS. Next question. Is in the okay. Um, the next question is by B. Waltz. Why are sinks disallowed as offsets? Yes, uh, because uh, sinks are very different. Uh, sinks credits, uh, CDM and JI sinks credits are very different instrument than uh, what we have in Europe. We are concerned about the, the permanency uh, of the credits. If you look at the UN rules on the CDM, uh, there have been some special category of credits have been uh, created for the sinks, so not the normal certified emission reductions, CRs as they're called, but you have two categories of uh, LSERs and TSERs, long-term and temporary sinks credits. So because we have, uh, we are concerned about some of those issues, but also about boundary problems, linkage problems. So if, if you, you, you uh, have one forest here, but you cut down another forest elsewhere, that we do for the time being, and we do not intend in the future to include uh, things credits into the EU ETS for the temporary nature and for the boundary problems, the leakage problems. Okay, the next question is, uh, you say that continuous emissions monitoring is not used, uh, that it's based on calculations, not measured emissions. Do you base what's measured on fuel inputs? If not, how are you sure the calculated values are reasonably accurate? Yes, uh, we do basically measure the fuel inputs. Uh, we have some some lab testing of the carbon con of the carbon uh, content of those fuels. We have uh, a very technical set of rules. This monitoring reporting guidelines is a technical set of rules of over 100 pages, which you can find on on the website that I give you a link to on on our EU ETS website. Uh, if you should have any more detailed questions on how we do this, I'm happy to get you in touch with with our with our experts on on the monitoring. But as I say, in principle, it's it's uh, based on fuel input with lab, lab testing and, and some of those safeguards worked into the rules. Okay. And the next question is by Dave C. I, and let me just say, it, I don't always have the full name of the person on here, so when I have it, I'm telling you it, but otherwise uh, I, I'm not. Dave C. asks, what are the specific obstacles, if any, to linking with North American countries, both U.S. and Canada? Uh, at this stage, the very specific obstacle is, is the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol, but as I alluded to, we are in the process of reviewing our, uh, our rules. Uh, beyond that, uh, what we and basically what the EU, we perceive ourselves that we have uh, designed and implemented a carbon market. It is a robust carbon market. So when we look at contemplate linking to other schemes, we of course we want to see, in, from the environmental point of view, equally robust markets, and also from the economic point of view, that are equally equally efficient as, as our market is operating. There are some issues that could uh, be obstacles for linking up the schemes, like the discussion in some of the U.S. congressional bills of including a price cap or a safety wealth feature that we do not have in Europe, which we would which we find not a useful feature both for environmental and economic reasons. So in principle, we are very open and happy uh, to uh, link with schemes across the world. Uh, we actually, but we want others to come as close as possible to meet or even be better than the environmental quality standard of the scheme that we have designed. Okay, the next question is from Eric Hyacin. How was the decision to auction 4% arrived at? Uh, the four percent is in effect a rough estimate, as I explained. Each and every member state in the second phase has uh, its own autonomous decision in its discretion to auction up to ten percent of the allowances they put into the market. We have, out of the twenty-seven member states, some eight or nine of the member states are auctioning some allowances. 
Nobody is using, no single country is using the full 10%. Uh, Germany, however, our biggest uh, participant in terms of the emissions covered is uh, auctioning 8.8% of its cap in phase two. We have the UK auctioning 7% of its cap, uh, the Netherlands auctioning 4%. And if you put all those numbers together, express them in absolute amount as a fraction of the total emissions cap, we get to roughly 35 to 4% of auctioning in phase two. Okay, the next one is Scott Dickey. Peter, what elements of a U.S.-based cap-and-trade scheme not currently anticipated through U.S. Uh, legislation, I think he means proposed legislation, uh, would, you, would you like to see in a, fed in a U.S. federal program? Uh, that's, that's a very, I think, a, a question one could have a long discussion now. I think, uh, and, uh, I, think I, I would just revert to what I said before. In principle, what, what we'd like to see is, is a, a robust carbon market where on the one hand we have uh, a robust emissions cap that is a real effort, meaning a real effort in there, and then also that the, the rules are designed in such a way that the regulator does not intervene in the market. Uh, we see, if, if, if I may allude a bit more, to the price cap or the safety valve idea. In the end, if, if you implement a carbon market and if you introduce a carbon price in your economy, one of the benefits you expect from this is the carbon price will lead to innovation, will lead people to develop new ways and means of, of going about producing goods that are carbon intensive. Uh, sometimes that carbon price may be at a higher level than what it is over the medium term. Uh, people will take their bets uh, how much of their, their R&D money they put into new carbon, de developing low carbon uh, products. So if you actually have some kind of a notion that the, that the regulator would come in if the price is perceived as politically perceived as getting too high, that, that, that uh, you would have intervention to the market, that could actually be very detrimental for the innovation benefits that you expect from uh, from introducing a carbon constraint and a carbon scheme in the first place. So that's why we are uh, rather sensitive on this notion of, of a safety wolf. But I say beyond that, it's, it's a too general a question to, to go into all the details. Let's go to the next one. Okay, Peter, I'm going to change it up a little. This one is uh, uh, should come in over the phone. Go ahead with your question. Take the next one. Um, hi. Um, if I understood you correctly, uh, the EU approach is an upstream uh, approach. How are... Uh, non-generating utilities or utilities that are purely distribution entities, particularly small distribution entities, how are they treated in terms of the point of regulation and or allowances? Uh, we are not an upstream, but we are downstream approach. So we, we cover the, the, util the, the power generator, the utility, and we have a capacity threshold of 20 megawatt or more of installed capacity. So all those installations, uh, power generating installations that have 20 megawatt or more of installed capacity, uh, they are covered by our scheme. Uh, inst installations below the 20 megawatt, they can be opted in, so it's up uh, at the discretion of each and every EU country that uh, smaller installations are opted in. Some member states have in fact gone that route that they opt in smaller installations, uh, but they can also be covered by other, by other uh, measures. In the end, as I explained before when I said the, the ETS is a cap within the Kyoto cap, so whatever member state does not include in addition to the mandatory coverage under the EU ETS, they are accountable for this under the Kyoto Protocol for the emissions from those installations, and it's at the discretion of those member states in which way they want to regulate them with technical standards, with some kind of, 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 of carbon tax and environmental charges. We also have carbon tax in some of our member states. So. There's a diversity of, of policy responses to installations below the size threshold. Okay, and now back to the written questions. We have a time for a co just a couple more. Um, let's see. This is from Stacy Waterman Hoy of Washington State Department of Energy, I believe. Uh, have you found the opportunity costs? sufficient to prevent hoarding of credits. Some concerns have been expressed that there are penalties for being short credits and no penalties for exceeding targets, creating unnecessary shortages. 
Okay, I'm rereading this question because it's quite a long one. I see it also on my screen. Uh, yeah, in principle, what, what we have seen... Uh, I think I mean, our penalties for, 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 for being short of credits, for exceeding the targets, are, are really very binding, as I explained to you before. So as we have an allowance price now of, of 20, 22 euros, if you do not deliver the allowance, uh, the financial penalty is 100 euro, 100 euro, and you still have to deliver the allowances in the following year. So I think we have some, some really uh, penalties with a deterrent function. Uh, whether we have seen hoarding of allowances, what we have seen, what, what the analysts uh, have, uh, have, uh, have uh, explained, explained in, in, on all the analysis they are doing, at the outset, uh, half of the ETS is power generators and the other half is more or less industrial installations. Power generators have been the ones who have been early on very active in the market. They are the ones who have been, have been allocated restrictive, as I said, in industrial installations who have been, at the beginning, also very skeptical about being uh, the introduction of the ETS and the, them being subject to it. They have not very actively used the market. So part of the explanation of, of, the, of the high price we saw in, in the first uh, 12 or 18 months of the scheme uh, before the first emissions data came and then we had the, price, the decline in the price was due to the fact that people say some of the Industrials who had very generous allocations, they were actually hoarding their allowances, sitting on the allowances, not selling them. So I think there's a certain hoarding behavior that you have seen early on in the program. I think it's no longer there now. Uh, I think that's, that's the answer I would uh, I can give on this question. Franz, where next? Okay. How about uh, this one? Is the EU considering adding the road transport sector later? Uh, in there's a bit of a debate, but it's not a very serious discussion at this stage. We have just, uh, before Christmas, we had adopted a new policy proposal uh, on the transport sector that would uh, mean a lot of headway in terms of the car fuel, the carbon efficiency standards for our cars. So we are having, we are working on other measures for the transport sector. Uh, some uh, stakeholders suggest that at some stage transport beyond aviation, transport should, uh, road transport should be included in the ETS, but there is no, I would say at this stage, no serious policy debate. Uh, we are not in any way close to uh, going into legislative process on this. Okay, let me ask uh, Chris Sherry, are you on the line? All right, well, Peter, if you don't mind taking a couple extra questions. Sure, go ahead. Um, uh, let's see, that's a leakage question. We've already answered that. Peter, you say you are willing to cooperate with other entities around the world. Is any software training or other resources available for other entities to start a similar program elsewhere? Uh, yes, uh, there's, we, are, we are very willing to cooperate. Uh, we are, for example, we are sharing with interested, part, interested parties our registry software. Uh, we have, we can help you in, you know, getting, uh, get you linked up with our experts, some of the research community. We, we can, uh, we have explained our materials. So there's all the help we can offer, and others, you know, just get in touch with us. Uh, it's something that's high on our agenda. Okay. Um. Is the EU ETS open to the notion of bilaterally trading with the CCX, the Chicago Climate Exchange, based on their present monitoring and verification? A uh, simple answer, no. It's not something we are contemplating. Because we want to, if we link up to markets, we want to link up to markets based on mandatory and, uh, on, on legislation, so not voluntary markets. One more front. Okay. Um, actually, Chris is on. Chris, I see you're, you've joined us. Yes, hi, Frank. Okay, great, Chris. Um, we'll be with you in just one second. Um, so, Peter, I want to thank you very much for taking part and answering our questions and appreciate you staying at work or staying up to, to, to be with us. Well, it was a pleasure with all of you. Thanks to you, Franz, for organizing this. And if there should be any follow-up questions uh, you find on the slide, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, in fact, <coughs> I didn't, in fact, include my email address. <laughs> But I think France is happy to broker further contacts if there should be more follow-up questions. So uh, I'll leave you now because it's late in Europe. It was a pleasure to be with you for the last hour and a bit, a bit over an hour.
Thanks, Peter. Right. Thanks, Peter. Um, so, we just a couple. Of, there were a couple of inquiries in the box about getting the slides. These will be mailed out to everyone who is registered for today's webinar. So you'll have uh, Peter's information. And if you want to get a message to Peter, you can shoot it through Laura Burns, whose email you have. If you don't have mine, uh, and uh, we'll we'll get it to him, and hopefully you'll have time to to address your question. Um, Laura, can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So I'm a, the, I don't know if you have a mute that you can put on your phone because I hear I, I'm not sure if it's you, but there's a. Okay. Echo. Um, let's see. The uh, next, we're very pleased to have Chris Sherry with us, and Chris, <laughs> like Peter, is joining us in the middle of other obligations. He just stepped away. He's a board member of the Climate Registry. He stepped out of a board meeting to be with you for this hour, and sure do appreciate it, Chris. That's why, Chris. Is, Chris is a senior research scientist for the New Jersey DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. Since just after the REGI project started back in 2003, Chris has served as a member of the steering committee of the REGI project, and I can attest was a huge part of, of REGI getting done. Uh, and for the last of about a year, he has been the chair of the group, um, affectionately dubbed the staff working group, which uh, designed the program and is now working to help the the regional nonprofit entity to implement REGI. Um, in addition to his leadership role in REGI, of course, Chris has been active in developing other climate change policies in New Jersey. Um, so, Chris, thanks very much for being with us. And we, uh, I think we're we're advancing your slides for you. So, if you want to just uh, tell us when to go to the next slide, Laura will um, will will move it up, move it forward. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Franz. Um, today I'd like to talk uh, about the design of, of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and, and the elements of its design that are impacting the debate uh, about the design of a national uh, market-based program to reduce uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, to set the stage, I'll, I'll give a brief overview uh, of REGI to uh, provide some context for this discussion, and then after this overview, I'd like to briefly summarize some of the design elements that uh, we believe are innovative and may have the most impact on the, the policy discussion surrounding a national program. Uh, if you could uh, advance to the next slide. Um, before I get into the, the specifications of REGI, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, take a moment to talk about a couple of key aspects of the process. Um, REGI has followed uh, a bottom-up design process, which has taken uh, more than three years, and there's still certain details, uh, especially with regard to the auction of allowances, that are still being uh, worked out. Um, Rather than um, the governors uh, who agreed to participate in the process setting specific mandates or goals up front, uh, they outlined a very general goal, um, the exploration of the design of a market-based program to reduce uh, CO2 emissions from power plants, and then asked policymakers and technical staff to design a detailed, uh, implementable regulatory program. And only after the specifics of the program were designed did decision makers bless it and commit to move forward um, with implementation. Um, I think two things are notable in terms of the, of the process um, that's guided REGI. Uh, first, um, the design process is, has involved active participation from both the energy regulators and the environmental regulators in each participating state. And in this regard, um, the REGI process is unprecedented in terms of uh, cap-and-trade program design. Um, and the design framework that was ultimately agreed to has been significantly influenced by um, the fact that we did have energy regulatory agencies at the table throughout the process. Uh, we've also held an extensive regional stakeholder process. Um, I believe uh, 12 regional stakeholder uh, meetings have been held to date, although at this point I'm starting to lose track. <laughs> and we posted a wealth of material on, on the REGI website, uh, which is at rggi.org, uh, for stakeholder review, including a draft version of uh, the model rule itself. So the program details have been um, fully vetted um, with both the regulated community and other affected uh, stakeholders. Uh, Franz, if you could advance to the next slide on timeline. Um, before I get into the specifics, I just wanted to provide an overview of um, the REGI implementation timeline. Um, a, mem a memorandum of understanding outlining the major components of the program was signed by the governors of seven states in December of 2005. Uh, these original signatories included New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire. Uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, which were original participants in the design uh, discussions, decided not to sign the MOU at this time, but both uh, subsequently signed the MOU in February of 2007. And also in April of 2007, Maryland signed the MOU pursuant to 
uh, legislation that was enacted in that state in 2006. So all of these signatory states have agreed to the basic framework for the program as laid out uh, in the MOU and have agreed to uh, propose for um, regulatory and or legislative uh, adoption uh, the model rule as uh, the program as substantially reflected in, in the model rule. Some of these states have also enacted legislation as part of the implementation process in particular to address um, the auctioning of allowances. And at this point, um, all the states are in various um, um, portions of their regulatory process to uh, implement the, the program through uh, rulemaking. A few states are still uh, in the legislative process to be followed up uh, by rulemaking. I'd be happy to uh, address questions on some of the, the, the individual uh, state timelines uh, as time allows. Uh, if you could advance to uh, the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, I'd just like to make a brief note on the model rule, uh, just to reemphasize the level of deliberation that's gone into the design of the program. Um, following a more than two-year design process, uh, we released a draft model rule uh, in March of 2006 and took comments uh, on that uh, draft. Uh, more than 100 organizations filed comments, and in August of 2006, after um, significant revisions in response to comments, we issued uh, a final model rule, which is available on, uh, on the REGI website. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, uh, slide five, program components. Um, so in terms of the basic uh, design of the program, uh, it would start in uh, January 1st of 2009. Uh, the program would apply to fossil fuel fired electric generating units, 25 megawatts and larger, uh, a two-phase cap. Uh, will be implemented. Uh, emissions will be stabilized through 2014 and reduced 10 percent uh, by 2018 relative to the initial cap start point. And I should note here that um, the cap, uh, as uh, negotiated by the states, is approximately 4 percent above average annual emissions um, from the, the 2000 through 2004 uh, time frame, uh, which is approximately equivalent to uh, 1990 emissions for uh, affected sources in the electric sector in participating states. Uh, the program calls for a full review in 2012, which will allow us to review the functioning of, of the Reggie allowance market uh, through the first compliance period and uh, consider potential mid-course corrections as may, may be warranted. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, slide six, uh, program components. Uh, fundamental aspects of REGI were designed to provide compliance flexibility while maintaining the uh, integrity of the emissions cap. Um, the program will have a three-year compliance period uh, with annual emissions reporting. Uh, so at the end of this uh, three-year period, affected sources would need to true up allowances uh, with their emissions during the, the compliance period. Uh, the banking of allowances for use in future compliance periods um, will be uh, allowed without limitation. Uh, one of the innovative program design elements that's received significant uh, attention is uh, the requirement that states allocate a minimum of 25 percent of their emissions budgets to uh, support what we've defined as consumer benefit or strategic energy purposes. Um, the definition of those terms is laid out in the MOU itself. Uh, these allowances would be auctioned in the revenue used to provide programmatic support for a number of measures such as uh, end-use energy efficiency and clean energy uh, technologies. And we're currently um, in detailed discussions uh, among the participating states uh, about um, coordinating a regional uh, allowance uh, uh, auction uh, mechanism and, and software platform. Um, the states that, that make up a significant majority of the regional emissions budget have committed to auctioning uh, either 100 percent or nearly 100 percent of their allowance budgets, uh, although not all states have specified uh, their level of auction. But the clear trend um, in the region is uh, through either a current commitment uh, to auction uh, 100 percent or uh, discussions in the remaining states about um, uh, whether uh, they should auction up to that level uh, with all states considering um, going significantly above the minimum 25 percent um, requirement. Um, this policy decision was made for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, first, the Reggie region is uh, predominantly restructured, so we have uh, deregulated competitive uh, wholesale uh, electric generation markets, um, which means that a substantial portion of the CO2 compliance costs uh, incurred through REGI will be passed through uh, in the price of wholesale uh, electricity, since the, the carbon compliance costs of the marginal unit uh, will impact the wholesale uh, market clearing price of electricity. Um, 
since the use of a free allowance has a market value and therefore an opportunity cost is, is attached to the use of that allowance, uh, this pass-through will be realized regardless of whether allowances are allocated freely or, or auctioned. And uh, second, uh, the second reason, and this is complementary to the first, really, is that utilizing this allowance revenue to support end-use energy efficiency allows a, a generator-focused cap-and-trade program to address, address uh, electricity demand, which obviously has a significant impact on carbon emissions and the compliance costs of regulated emissions sources. Uh, so this allows uh, the program to pursue uh, an integrated least cost approach to reducing sectoral emissions um, by essentially taking both a generator source-based approach and uh, a load-based approach uh, to the reduction of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, uh, slide seven, uh, which is Reggie program components focused on, on offsets. Um, Another aspect of the program um, that some consider to be um, innovative is the approach that Reggie takes to um, emissions offsets. Uh, of course, I'm referring to, uh, as an offset, I'm referring to a project-based emissions reduction or uh, carbon sequestration that occurs outside of the capped uh, sector. Uh, the Reggie program specifies detailed criteria for categories of offsets in the model rule rather than outlining uh, a process for case-by-case -case review, uh, such as the process under the CDM. And eligible offsets include um, end use energy efficiency in the building sector related to uh, fossil fuels, uh, afforestation, landfill gas capture and destruction, uh, methane capture and destruction from uh, agricultural uh, manure management uh, practices, in particular uh, anaerobic digesters, uh, sulfur hexafluoride leak reduction in the electricity uh, transmission and distribution sector, and uh, the ability to utilize international carbon allowances and credits under uh, limited circumstances. If you could advance to the next slide, uh, slide eight, offset requirements. Um, while the eligible categories are, are initially limited, the goal is to expand uh, the categories of eligible offsets over time, um, and we would envision incorporating uh, new regulatory standards into the program as we go forward. Um, one thing I should note uh, in terms of the general approach we've taken is that we're taking a standardized approach uh, to evaluating project additionality and other eligibility requirements by using benchmarks and performance standards uh, to infer financial additionality. And this decision was really taken for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we felt that it uh, was helpful to have all the criteria uh, elaborated out front um, to give both project developers and um, interested stakeholders uh, a sense of comfort with the program and that it wouldn't be sub uh, potentially subject to uh, subjective uh, decisions by some uh, uh, panel or other uh, governing governing body or individually by state staff uh, themselves. Um, and then the other reason was more, a more practical one um, in that as state agencies we have uh, limited resources and creating a framework for a case-by-case -case, uh, review of projects and not limiting the scope of those reviews um, was seen as being uh, significantly resource intensive and, and frankly uh, we didn't feel that we had the capacity to uh, implement that type of a system and, and also maintain the uh, the environmental integrity of an offset system as well as uh, a program that, that functions smoothly and actually gets uh, projects from project application to approval and into the market. Uh, if you could advance to the, the next slide, slide nine, uh, which focuses on the geographic scope of the offset component. Um, offsets may be located uh, in Reggie participating states, uh, the 10 states or in other U.S. jurisdictions provided that uh, the participating Reggie states have executed uh, a memorandum of understanding with a regulatory agency in a partner state uh, to provide us with compliance and enforcement uh, assistance. Um, staff has uh, developed a, an initial framework for a model uh, offsets MOU with other uh, states, uh, which is under discussion, but executing uh, any such MOUs uh, will be at the discretion of uh, the Reggie agency heads. If uh, a $10 allowance price trigger is uh, hit, uh, international carbon currencies could be utilized as offsets under Reggie, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the offset triggers uh, in a moment. Um, if you could advance to slide 10, uh, titled Offsets Limit on Use. Uh, there's a quantitative limit on, on the use of offsets in the Reggie program, uh, equivalent to 3.3% of a source's reported emissions in any uh, compliance period. Um, I should note that the, the offset limit applies to uh, the affected uh, regulated source, but not to the issuance of offsets, so there's no limit on the amount of offsets that can be 
uh, approved by regulators and, and enter the Reggie, uh, the Reggie market. Um, the program also includes a couple of price triggers, um, the intent of which is to moderate potentially high allowance prices by expanding the ability to use offsets and also extending uh, the compliance period uh, under certain circumstances. Uh, if a $7 per ton uh, allowance price trigger is hit, which we've defined as uh, a $7 price uh, over a 12-month rolling average period, uh, the limit on the use of offsets expands to 5% of the source's reported emissions. If a $10 trigger is hit, uh, again defined on a 12-month uh, rolling average basis, the limit on the use of offsets expands to 10% of the source's uh, reported emissions. And also, uh, under this contingency, uh, international uh, carbon allowances and credits uh, could be used as offsets for compliance uh, under the program. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, this is a, a, a graphic uh, representation of how we derive the 3.3% the limit. Um, the 3.3% per, metric is uh, generally equivalent to 50% of the projected avoided emissions that will need to be achieved through 2020 to meet the cap. And this was derived based on uh, the energy sector simulation modeling that we conducted as part of the program design. And basically, uh, we took a look at uh, the cap start point and calculated 50% of the delta between um, projected business as usual emissions uh, absent the program and the cap for the Reggie program, uh, with the 3.3% representing um, this amount if averaged over the course of the program and then represented as a percentage of the initial uh, annual emissions budget. So hopefully that's uh, understandable. If not, I'd, I'd be happy to address uh, questions um, after the presentation. Um, and finally, if you could uh, advance to the last slide. Um, so those are the basics of the program, and I guess to summarize, I'd like to briefly discuss uh, the elements of the program that we feel are innovative and uh, instructive for the design of a federal cap-and-trade program, um, and then I'd be happy to, to take your questions. Um, the first element, obviously, is uh, the Reggie program's approach to allowance allocation, um, which has emerged as a move toward um, large-scale auctions. Um, and the influence of this policy decision, I think, is already evident in that most of the federal proposals in the U.S. incorporate some degree of, of allowance auction. Um, and uh, previously, a, a few years ago, the, the notion that you would auction any uh, allowances uh, was something that was uh, relatively unprecedented. So I think the policy discussion on this issue is, has uh, uh, really moved dramatically. And, and in part, it's been due to Reggie. It's also been due to the experience um, evidenced in, in the European, uh, the EU uh, ETS emission uh, trading scheme. Um, and um, the, based on that experience, it, it's become clear that the rationale for, for auction uh, clearly makes sense. Um, I should also note that the, I think the innovative aspect of the REGI uh, move towards auctions is not just the fact that large-scale auctions are, have been proposed to address some of these uh, cost pass-through issues, but that it's also really um, that the focus of the program has been on using uh, allocation revenue to reduce electricity demand. Um, this was a key driver um, from, our, from our standpoint in, in terms of recommending a large-scale auction approach. Um, and um, the use of this revenue to, to support programs that reduce uh, electricity and allows a source-based cap-and-trade program to incorporate a load-based approach uh, that aggressively uh, promotes end-use energy efficiency and which we think will uh, help the program uh, reduce emissions from a sectoral standpoint at, at lower uh, overall cost. Um, the other major component that I think is innovative is the way that Reggie provides a package of flexibility mechanisms to attempt to mitigate uh, market volatility and uh, limit uh, compliance costs without resorting to uh, price caps or safety valves. Um, this uh, flexibility package includes the uh, unlimited ability to bank allowances, um, a three-year compliance period, which um, is designed to address uh, temporal uh, variations in electricity generation um, and emissions that can be uh, influenced by things such as fuel markets and, and weather, um, and price triggers that allow for a greater use of offsets as allowance prices uh, increase. And uh, finally, um, I think that Reggie takes an innovative approach to uh, administering an offsets component uh, by implementing a standardized approach that set criteria up front uh, in regulation, uh, utilizing benchmarks and performance standards to evaluate uh, project additionality. And this, um, we believe, int uh, increases uh, program transparency, uh, reduces regulatory discretion, 
um, and is also expected to reduce project transaction costs for both uh, project developers and uh, uh, regulators. So thanks very much for the opportunity to provide the overview, and uh, I, I turn it back over to Franz. Thanks very much, Chris. We have a few questions that have been entered in online, which I'll read in a minute. Those of you who would like to ask, ask, uh, ask Chris a question directly by over your phone should punch in star one, and that'll put you in the queue. And there, right now, there is no one in the queue, um, so I'll start with the first written question, and it's a whopper. Do you expect to expand Reggie to some other sectors? Um, I guess uh, our focus has been primarily on um, implementing the program that we have uh, first and foremost, although um, during the, um, the initial discussions about uh, Reggie, um, uh, an action plan was developed uh, by staff and endorsed by agency heads that uh, we would consider uh, once the, the electricity sector cap and trade program has been implemented, uh, expanding um, Reggie to other industrial sources. So uh, no decision at this point has been taken on expanding to other uh, sources and sectors, but I think it's likely if one was taken that it would be consideration of expanding uh, at least initially to uh, other industrial uh, uh, sources, so uh, large point emitters. Okay. The next one uh, f um, from participant 112. There's no name here. Will there be any credits allocated for telecommuting activities? Sure. Um, there are no, uh, and I guess that might be in the context of, of, of an offset. At this point, there, there is no eligible category that would address uh, transportation-related uh, emissions. So uh, that's potentially something that may be uh, considered looking at the transport sector in the context of offsets uh, as we move over time to, to expand those uh, eligible categories, but there's no avail availability for that at this point. Okay. Next question is... I think we have a shy group here. They're, they're coming in over the, over the in writing rather than signing up to to speak in person. Let's see. Uh, the next one is: Can Chris highlight a few advantages of cap and trade over a carbon tax? Um, I think the fundamental uh, benefit is that you have regulatory uh, certainty with regard to emissions levels, and giving. Given the pressing environmental challenge from climate change, I think that's going to be critical uh, that we implement programs that actually guarantee a certain level of emissions reduction. Uh, with the carbon tax, um, while you're, you're providing an incentive uh, for changing behavior in the market, it's unclear um, uh, what level of financial incentive would be uh, required to um, incentivize certain uh, levels of behavioral and technical change um, in terms of uh, reducing emissions. With the cap-and-trade program, uh, you set the environmental criteria, and then the market establishes the price that's required to achieve that environmental goal. So I think that's the primary uh, benefit, although uh, there could conceivably be scenarios where you might want to consider the implementation of both both a cap-and-trade program and, and a complementary uh, tax policy. Okay. Next question is Lee Yen Anderson, and his question is, are landfill gas projects in the region allowed to sell offsets as well as renewable energy certificates for renewable portfolio standard compliance? Are there any Reggie states that already mandate a landfill gas capture as part of air quality regulations? Um, to address the last question first, I guess I'm not aware of any uh, regulatory mandates at this point across the states in, in uh, the Reggie region that would require uh, landfill gas capture. Um, to address the REC issue, um, there is no prohibition on a, a landfill gas project having an electricity generation component and selling electricity into the market and also qualifying for um, a REGI uh, offset. Although for an additionality, for primaries and additionality issue, we do, do require that if there is an electric generation component, um, that the project developer uh, transfer uh, the rights to any renewable energy certificates that are generated um, to the regulatory agency. And the premise here is that given the current e economics of landfill gas projects and uh, the RPS regulatory driver, uh, that if we didn't have this condition, um, it was likely that landfill gas projects could piggyback on the RPS markets and uh, qualify on, uh, for uh, offset allowances as well. Uh, where the, the actual economic driver would, uh, would most likely be um, generation of those racks for sale in the RPS market. So 
we felt that from an additionality standpoint, we needed to uh, make that distinction and essentially uh, require uh, projects to pick a market, be it the RPS market uh, or the, the Reggie offset uh, market. And we've acknowledged that this could be problematic from an economic standpoint for certain projects, but that it was uh, ultimately critical from an additionality standpoint to ensure that the, the Reggie offset component was what, in fact, was driving uh, these offset projects. Uh, one other thing to note is that uh, we also have a, a, an NSPS requirement where um, landfill projects would not uh, could not be subject to NS EPA NSPS uh, requirements. So we're talking about a, a subset of smaller landfills that would be eligible to uh, qualify for for offset allowances. And NSPS is New Source Performance Standard. Yes. Let's see. Um, next question is Scott Dickey. We just heard from Peter that the EU ETS has a significant financial penalty for noncompliance. What penalties are in place for noncompliance with REGI requirements? Uh, for REGI, it would be the submission of allowances at a, a three to one uh, ratio uh, for any uh, uh, deficit in terms of allowances submitted, and then uh, additional administrative uh, penalties would be at the discretion of the individual states based on their uh, existing. Uh, uh, penalty regulations and, and uh, statutory authority. Okay, next one is from Chris Crook. Would you please amplify what you mean by quote unquote standardized approach uh, uh, to evaluate additionality? Um, sure. Um, in terms of uh, what, I, what I laid out were things such as uh, benchmarks or uh, performance standards. And just to, to give a few uh, examples, a benchmark is a qualitative uh, criterion uh, to evaluate additionalities, uh, like the one that I just mentioned uh, in terms of landfill gas projects, where you have this uh, requirement that if a project is going to uh, be eligible for offset allowances, it would need to sub uh, surrender. Uh, rights to the RECs to the regulatory agency. So that's a qualitative criterion uh, that addresses current standard market practice issues. Um, we would consider that to be a benchmark. Uh, a performance standard could be things such as uh, an emissions rate uh, performance level uh, above for which state offset projects would need to surpass uh, energy efficiency criteria or a market penetration rate uh, where you evaluate the ten penetration of those types of projects in the current market. Um, and the eligible categories under REGI for offsets uh, use a combination of these different uh, benchmarks and performance standards depending on the specific scenario and market segment, segment that, we're, uh, that we're dealing with. And those, uh, those criteria are laid out in detail in the, in the model rule. Um, and in some instances, we, we utilize both a benchmark and a performance standard in, in combination. Okay, great. Uh, the next one is from Lee Alter, and the question is, what was the main reason other sectors weren't included up front? Um, the, the basic reason, I guess, was that uh, we, as states in the Northeast, had experience um, cooperating on cap-and-trade programs through the Knox, Knox Budget Program. Um, there was, uh, you know, existing infrastructure already had been instituted by EPA for emissions monitoring and things of that nature, so the infrastructure uh, was already in existence for uh, cap-and-trade programs in the power sector as well as that institutional framework was, o was already there in terms of uh, states cooperating uh, through the Ozone Transport Commission on uh, implementing uh, a cap-and-trade program together. Uh, so we felt that we had both the institutional knowledge and uh, the technical knowledge to, to implement a program in that sector. Um, so I think there was a significant comfort level uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that we weren't uh, biting off more than we could chew at that, at that time to, uh, to you know, limit it to the power sector. Um, a number of the states were also engaged on policies to address the transportation sector um, through uh, the California car standards, uh, addressing uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, standards for uh, automobiles. Uh, so we were also taking actions, a number of us, to uh, explore uh, other policy measures to address the transport sector. So um, at least at the point that we were at, uh, I don't think we were comfortable with um, uh, trying to uh, design a, a multi-sector cap-and-trade program. Uh, like the West Coast states are, are doing currently. Okay. Next one is, I, I'd, I'd just like to add to that, Chris. Um, if you think about the timing of it, too, this was announced in early 2003, so it's a full four years before uh, the Western Climate Initiative, for example, was launched. And 
I, I think most of us will agree it's a it was a very it's a very diff, different political environment for states that are out there on the edge of climate change action. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I also think that you know the, the there's a lot of technical work that's been done from then till now to in terms of evaluating. Uh, emissions from other sectors and, and policy uh, mechanisms to address them as well. Okay, Greg San Martin is the next questioner. He, he asks, I know that the transportation sector is not currently covered in Reggie. Transport accounts for anywhere from 37 to 50 percent of Western Climate Initiative. I assume he means emissions. Approximately what percentage of overall greenhouse gas emissions in the Reggie region do the power generation and transportation sectors each make up currently, if you know? Uh, well, I know for the power sector, it's 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 roughly uh, a third. Uh, it varies across states. Um, in terms of, uh, I can speak to New Jersey for the transport sector. Uh, that accounts for approximately 50 50 percent of our CO2 emissions uh, come from the transport sector. Uh, for greenhouse gases, I believe it's in the just under 40 percent. And for New York, it was just I know off the top of my head, it was about 35% was transport, but it was the fastest growing segment. Um, Dave C. asks, what happens to Reggie if the Lieberman-Warner bill is passed? Uh, that's a great question, and <laughs> I guess I'm, I think there's, uh, it's unclear at this point. Um, I know that uh, congressional staff, also staff for Lieberman's office, have, have been discussing this issue uh, in terms of what would ultimately happen. Um, as sovereign states uh, in the Northeast, we would definitely like to see, uh, we would not see uh, preemption. We would like to see an outcome at the federal level where uh, states have the ability to go above and beyond minimum federal standards. Um, I think we've demonstrated uh, historically that, you know, we're, we're laboratories of democracy, if you will. Uh, a number of the federal initiatives have ultimately grown uh, from uh, state efforts and that uh, I guess our premise is that any federal program that's ultimately adopted is, is going to be the first uh, step in an ongoing uh, process, uh, both uh, statutory and regulatory, given the, the magnitude of the climate change uh, issue. And that we would definitely think that it's, it's of value to the, the, the U.S. as a whole to, to maintain that ability for states to go above and beyond um, uh, minimum federal standards and to, to drive uh, regulatory innovation going forward. Okay, Chris, I have a one, one bold questioner who's, who's calling, who's going to ask it to you orally. Go ahead, questioner. Uh, this is Tom O'Connor with Oregon Municipal Electric Utility Association. If, if Reggie is a generation-based approach, have you thought about how uh, you would interface trade with the WCI if the WCI were to adopt a... Um, load-based cap-and-trade mechanism whereby the point of regulation would be as far down as the distribution utility and allowances would uh, be issued at that level as well? Um, we've had some internal discussions at the staff level. Uh, I think they've been, I'd characterize them as, as preliminary. Um, if WCI moves forward with uh, uh, a load-based approach, I, I think there definitely are issues with regard to the monitoring and reporting of emissions, uh, given that under a load-based system, at least for undifferentiated power, uh, where it's not uh, pursuant to a, a direct uh, bilateral contract, a plant-specific contract, that you would have to use uh, default uh, emissions factors uh, for certain categories of, of, of power. Uh, so I think there are issues that would need to be resolved in terms of the level of rigor of monitoring and reporting and whether it's considered to be comparable to um, the Reggie monitoring and reporting requirements, which are based on the EPA Part 75 uh, direct monitoring uh, at the stack. Uh, I think that's one issue. Um, so in terms of linking uh, with programs, it's definitely uh, whether um, the, the rigor of uh, monitoring and reporting is deemed uh, comparable across the programs is one key issue uh, that would need to be resolved, as it would with, with linking to any other uh, cap-and-trade program. Um, the other issue potentially is that depending on, on the geographic scope and whether it, it physically abuts the, the Reggie region, if you had a load-based system interfacing with a generator-based system, you could have the potential for uh, double counting of emissions. Uh, I don't know that that would necessarily be uh, an issue for uh, the West Coast system, but as that system expanded, if it did over time, uh, could be, become an issue in terms of interface and, and how you make that distinction uh, between uh, emissions, um, indirect emissions, 
uh, from a power pool, uh, you know, that may be adjacent to uh, a, a generator-based uh, uh, region where there are a power pool subject to a generator-based cap-and-trade program. There'd be power flows between those two regions, potentially, and there would be issues in terms of how to uh, attribute emissions from one party to the other. I think that could raise uh, potential issues. Okay. Um, right on, right related to that, Chris, is a written question that can Reggie link with California or WCI? I don't know if you want to add on a more general statement that goes beyond just the load versus. Uh, I think, generator. well, I guess uh, generally, I mean, our goal uh, for Reggie has been to, to expand the program to other states and, and, uh, uh, and uh, entities. Um, we would like to see that happen. We're also open, open to uh, discussing uh, linking programs. Uh, from a general philosophical standpoint, I think the states that are engaged in Reggie would like to grow uh, a carbon market in the U.S., uh, so we definitely would like to have those discussions with the West Coast states and, and evaluate uh, potential issues that might emerge uh, in terms of the design of their system, and I think our focus, at least initially in having those discussions, would be try to identify any technical design issues or other uh, policy issues that uh, might preclude linking, um, whether it be with regard to uh, certain policy decisions that might uh, be taken that we feel would adversely impact the environmental integrity of uh, a West Coast trading program, or whether it's also it might be more technical issues related to um, emissions monitoring, reporting, and things of those, things of that nature. Uh, so I think the, our focus, at least uh, initially, that, that we'd like to see going forward, given that the West Coast program is still under development, is to try to identify what those issues might be uh, that we feel uh, could preclude linking in the future. And then, obviously, once a uh, West Coast uh, program was put into place and fully designed, we'd need to evaluate the comparability of that program uh, to the East Coast program. And I think we'd also have to identify uh, the economic issues that are involved as well, because you may have different markets due to their scope uh, of coverage and other uh, issues that might uh, clear at, at different uh, allowance prices, and we definitely have to take that into consideration as well, because ultimately that linking would have an impact on our electricity rate payers in the, in the Reggie region. Hey, sorry about that, Chris. My, my mouse figure, trigger finger was a little happy. Uh, go ahead, questioner, on the phone. This is Janelle Schmidt at BPA. Um, I'm wondering if there's provisions in the model rule to recognize increases in electricity sector baseline emissions in the event that electrical vehicles cause cross-sector emission shifts? Uh, I guess I'm somewhat unclear on that. Uh, ultimately, w we adopted uh, a, a negotiated cap level. We looked at historic emissions from uh, sources that would be affected under REGI as a starting point for that discussion and then arrived uh, at, a, at a, uh, an overall cap level on a negotiated basis. Um, so we weren't looking at underlying activity data that might be impacting uh, the emissions uh, of those facilities. And it, it, it sounds like the implication of your question is, were you considering uh, on a, a prospective basis whether the increased use of electric vehicles could actually increase sectoral emissions uh, from the electricity sector and whether the sort of the life cycle benefits of, of that uh, increased usage should be considering considered when setting a, a, a cap for the power sector? Is that sort of where you're going? Yeah, and more that if because it's not your cap is not cross sectoral, that if there's pieces that aren't being captured, so it looks like the emissions are going up when in fact the overall emissions are going down because there's a f fuel switching essentially in the transportation sector to electricity. Um, I, I think ultimately uh, the the Reggie program would impact the overall carbon intensity of the electricity. Uh, it's it's uh, the electricity generated, it's neutral with regard to the amount of electricity generated. Uh, so uh, I think there are issues that you've identified and, and given that uh, on a prospective basis, uh, but potentially uh, policies that address uh, low carbon vehicles could be complementary with a, a generator focused cap and trade program. But I agree that going forward as those cross sectoral uh, issues arise, uh, you'd want to consider them in, in the context of a, the design of a program that only addresses a certain sector. Okay, the next question is, uh, looks like from Illinois EPA, if, they, uh, if I'm reading the acronym correctly. Who is responsible for the overall, quote unquote, overseeing of the REGI program since, likely, since it's likely that no single state will be shouldering the burden? That's the first question, then I'll let you answer that one. 
Um, we've we've been cooperating closely throughout the um, design of the program, and as part of setting up the uh, administrative in infrastructure for the program, things such as an emissions and allowance tracking system, uh, as well as a, a, a platform for auctioning allowances, uh, we're collaborating jointly and, and intend to deliver those as a as a joint regional product. Um, in particular, um, in particular, we have. Um, uh, formed a 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, that will be responsible for directly administering that regional infrastructure. Uh, although I should uh, underline that no regulatory authority would be ceded to that uh, that organization. Uh, so while they would be responsible for setting up the platforms, uh, ultimate regulatory control over the use of a state's allowances, uh, the approval of an auction uh, process, things of that nature would be retained. Uh, by the individual states, um, but we are we're, we're seeking to use that nonprofit organization as a body to coordinate the, the setup of that regional infrastructure that, that will underlie the, the the trading program. Will individual states be responsible for? Oh man, somehow the check it just got turned off. Um, oh, there it is. It's back. Uh, um, next, second question same questioner. Will the individual states be responsible for distributing the auction revenue? How will that work? Uh, essentially, you would have a scenario where, in the context of a regional auction, you would have um, individual states submitting for auction allowances from their respective emissions budgets to a regional auction platform. Uh, those states would remain in state accounts. They might be in a special custodial account, something of that nature. You would have the auction process take place. Uh, the market would clear at a certain price, and then financial settlement uh, activities would commence. And essentially, you would have a scenario where uh, a, a party would not be bidding on specific state allowances, say a New York or New Jersey allowances. They be they would be bidding on a fully fungible Reggie allowance. At the point of financial clearing, you would based on a pro rata share. Essentially, you would have uh, financial settlements to individual state uh, financial accounts and then settlement of allowances from individual state accounts to the account of that purchaser. So that they would most likely be, uh, turn, when the final allowance transaction takes place, they would probably get a mix of allowances from all 10 states based on a pro rata uh, uh, distribution. Um, so that the, all the financial and allowance uh, uh, settlement activity would occur at the state level, but the interface with the bidder would be through this regional auction platform. Okay. Just a reminder, if you want to ask an oral question, you just hit star one on your phone and you'll be queued up and we'll take your question. Um, another one here for you, Chris. Is leakage still a problematic issue and can you elaborate on the primary concerns there? Um, I think leakage is, is still a concern. Um, obviously, uh, with Reggie, we're implementing a program where uh, we have three uh, electric ISOs impacted uh, New England ISO, New York ISO, and, and the PJM ISO, uh, where in particular only a portion of the PJM uh, ISO is covered uh, under REGI. Um, so obviously there's the potential for um, competitiveness issues uh, that could ultimately impact the dispatch of generators and potentially uh, result in an increase in, in uh, dispatch from generators that are in non-affected uh, regions. Um, Throughout the design process, when we designed Reggie, we, we, we were keeping close tabs on this issue, and I think in many ways um, the Reggie program is modest by design uh, with an eye to the potential for emissions leakage. So in terms of dealing with the flexibility mechanisms that are incorporated in the program as well as the cap level itself, a lot of those uh, decisions were taken um, while addressing the potential for leakage and trying to mitigate that potential. So. Um, given the cards that we were dealt with in terms of the region that's covered, any system that created an allowance prices that would be, um, you know, what might be considered high by different parties or very significant allowance prices uh, could potentially drive uh, emissions leakage. So we did design the program to be initially modest. In particular, uh, this was one of the reasons why. Um, that said, I think it's unclear where the, the Reggie market is going to clear at and what the allowance prices are going to be and then by extension what the potential is. Uh, for these dynamics to play out. Um, staff has taken a very close look at this um, and developed a report that's available on the REGI website that evaluates the potential for emissions leakage as well as some policy uh, mechanisms that could be used to mitigate it. Uh, at this point, we've worked with the ISOs to institute 
uh, revisions to their current uh, environmental monitoring systems, uh, the PJM gas system, the New England GIS systems that essentially monitor uh, every megawatt hour generated generated in those ISOs and the environmental um, characteristics of that generation to allow us to track over time uh, emissions from all the generators that serve load in the REGI region in those ISOs so that we can look to see whether, in fact, once the REGI program rolls out, that it is, uh, whether it's having any uh, significant impact in terms of uh, emissions from non-affected uh, generators. Um, in evaluating the issue, at least initially, based on a um, uh, a, a lower uh, allowance prices on the lower end of the spectrum, um, given the the the, uh, the very localized and regionalized nature of uh, dispatch of generators in those ISOs, uh, that the potential for leakage is, is modest, uh, presuming uh, lower uh, allowance prices. Um, although it's an issue that we feel we need to keep very close tabs on, and uh, obviously uh, the 2012 program review would be taking a very close look at whether uh, there's been any significant impact. Uh, on uh, leakage. I should also notice that in New Jersey, noted that in New Jersey, uh, legislation was passed uh, recently that would require the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities to implement a, a, a mechanism to mi mitigate the potential for emissions leakage, in particular an emissions portfolio standard, uh, as a complement to uh, the REGI uh, program. Uh, so, uh, initial staff discussions are beginning uh, in New Jersey based on that. Uh, legislative mandate as well. Um, so I guess from a general standpoint, I'd say that, yes, the potential is there. We don't know uh, how significant it ultimately may be. Given that, we're going to be monitoring it very closely, and we acknowledge that um, there are a lot of uh, variables that go into the dispatch of generators in a uh, wholesale power market, and that the impacts are likely to be uh, site-specific and localized, um, and it's unclear to what extent uh, essentially a carbon price signal might trump some of those other factors that impact the localized uh, dispatch of generators uh, in terms of the, you know, locational marginal prices uh, in, in power markets. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, do you anticipate more states to sign on to the MOU? Um, I, we'd love to see more states join. Uh, I, I don't know that there are any that are in final discussions with us at this point. Um, so I guess I guess that's the extent I could give to that. Uh, the door is always open. We'd, we'd like to actively engage with states that, that may be considering um, uh, uh, joining a cap and trade program. I know there's, uh, uh, in, I guess, in my understanding, is in the Illinois stakeholder process, there was some discussion about uh, joining other cap and trade programs and some specific discussions about um, uh, joining REGI or participating in the REGI market through some sort of uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, I know that Florida is also looking at uh, uh, cap and trade in the context of their power sector. So um, we would love to have more states join, and I guess we don't feel that uh, states that are uh, not geographically contiguous to the current states would necessarily be precluded from, from joining the REGI program. Okay. Uh, next one is, what auction rules are in place to avoid gaming by auction participants? Um, this is currently under discussion. Um, but in general, uh, I think the academic experts have pointed to the fact that to uh, prevent collusion among bidders, uh, it's essential to have a, a reserve price, uh, a minimum floor above which allowances would not be sold. Okay. Um, please elaborate on how addi additionality issues are evaluated in a standardized way. Give examples. This one came in after you asked the la answered it last time, Chris. I don't know. If okay. You have just um, a couple. Of sure. Uh, I, essentially, a project would be evaluated on specific metrics. Uh, so whether it meets the requirements in the in the model rule, which are are pretty prescriptive, so it would be a, a pretty clear cut uh, exercise. You know, does it or does it not meet uh, a performance standard, or does it not meet a benchmark? Uh, so. Uh, you know, it's very clear cut in the, in the context of the benchmark. Uh, for performance standards, uh, the project uh, sponsor would need to demonstrate to us that the project meets those uh, uh, performance standards, be it energy efficiency criteria, market penetration rate, or, or, or an emission rate. Okay. Next one is during the design phase, why was the minimum auction level set at 25% when nearly all participants indicate willingness to auction a much greater amount? 
Um, I guess, and I guess I should clarify too that the, the, the decision was on a uh, minimum 25% to consumer benefit or strategic energy purpose. The, the premise internally was, yes, it, it probably makes the most sense to auction these allowances, but we didn't preclude um, states also directly allow, uh, allocating allowances to support those uh, goals as well. So it wasn't a, a specific mandate on auction, although we did acknowledge that's probably what would happen going forward. Um, I, to be frank, I think it's really uh, a, a nod to the fact that uh, this was unprecedented in terms of recommending any level of auction, and uh, states also wanted to retain uh, individual uh, discretion in terms of how they allocated allowances. So uh, the, the MOU agreement at 25 percent was seen as a floor, uh, where we felt that it was, it was critical to have that component to the program, uh, but we did acknowledge that uh, States might have individual concerns uh, that they wanted to address through allocation, uh, and that also just from a general standpoint, states were very clear that they wanted to maintain uh, primary discretion in terms of how they allocated the majority of their, their emissions budget. Okay. Um, let's see the next one. How are non-signers to the MOU accounted for in um, – I guess I'll skip that because I don't understand that. Uh, how are non-signers to the MOU accounted for and allowances assigned to members? I don't, I, do you understand that, Chris? Um, whoever asked that question, if you'd like to rephrase it, just uh, type it in again, please. Um, let's see. While auction revenues can be used to reduce demand, there will be an increase in the total cost of the program. Greater costs drive a greater amount of leakage. Was there any study done to arrive at a quote-unquote sweet spot balancing the usefulness of the auction revenues against the utility of causing leakage, or the futility of causing leakage through higher costs? Um, we did, through the, the energy sector simulation modeling that we conducted, evaluate uh, leakage in terms of net emission reductions uh, occurring. Uh, so we, we had projections of leakage uh, at different cap levels and through different uh, policy design mechanisms. So we would get output in terms of allowance price, projected allowance price, as well as uh, projected emissions leakage. So we definitely had uh, the crosswalk between uh, levels of allowance prices and the impact that they might have on, on emissions leakage. Um, we also evaluated um, energy efficiency as a supply-side resource through this, the simulation modeling where we allowed the model to uh, select uh, an option of whether to build a new power plant to meet load or to uh, reduce load through the implementation of energy efficiency um, uh, programs, and we base that on the current spending that's going forward in the region right now. So we definitely also saw the connection that as you put more uh, demand-side resources into the system, allowance prices go down, projected leakage goes down. Uh, so we were keeping a close eye on all of those variables when uh, we went through the discussions on, on where to set the cap and, and also the, the broader uh, design structure of the program. Chris, I wonder if you accept the premise of the question, too, that the auction would actually increase the cost of oh, the Oh, I, I, I guess maybe I didn't, I didn't catch that. Uh, no, I think we're clear that, and, and uh, the technical experts and the academics have also, and also speaking to generators that participate in the, the wholesale electricity markets, have, have uh, made it clear to us that um, whether you allocate allowances for free or you sell them, uh, there would be no impact on the market clearing price of allowances due to how the, the uh, wholesale electricity markets function. So if you're given allowances for free, you're still going to factor in the, the, the opportunity cost of allowances. That is the, the market value of that allowance and what you could gain by not generating and, and selling it to another party. You're going to factor in that CO2 compliance cost into your dispatch bid into the wholesale power market, whether you receive that allowance for free or you're required to, to purchase it. So it was clear to us based on talking with the experts and the market participants in terms of how the markets function that it wasn't going to have any impact on uh, the overall impact of the program on electricity uh, prices. So then given that, uh, A, we wanted to minimize that pass-through because you're dealing with transfer of assets from the regulated community to electricity ratepayers. That was one issue that we were concerned with. The other issue was that given that, uh, it made the most sense to utilize that revenue um, to try to reduce electricity demand in the region and, and mitigate the uh, impacts of, on electricity ratepayers, the actual allowance price itself, uh, going forward and minimize the cost uh, impact of the, of the program on consumers. Okay, we have time for just a couple more. Um, this one is on uh, offsets. 
There are clearly two distinct environmental benefits that result from the voluntary capture of methane and subsequent voluntary use of captured renewable methane for electricity generation. There are also two distinct credits that recognize each benefit. Despite having two credits, there is no double counting of reductions. Can you elaborate on why one of these credits must be retired under the REGI rules? Uh, one issue, one issue. The issue was primarily an additionality issue in terms of uh, with an offset, given that you're going to be creating a new allowance that an affected generator can use, uh, you need to have reasonable certainty that the offset component is actually, in fact, what's driving that that project. So it was clearly, we did not want a scenario where uh, Reggie offset allowances are simply free riding on the the RPS market, so that the projects are being driven by RPS compliance but we're also giving them an allowance. We wouldn't, we wouldn't consider that to be a real incremental emission reduction that's actually due to REGI. Uh, the other issue may be implied, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm understanding it, it correctly, is, is maybe to the, uh, addressing why we're not crediting uh, for indirect uh, avoided uh, emissions due to the fact that those uh, landfill projects are destroying methane, so that's one category of emission reduction, but they're also avoiding the need for conventional generation in the in the power sector, and, and I, I think the question may have been, why are you not also providing uh, an emission reduction credit for that avoided emissions from electricity generation? Uh, the issue there uh, was that uh, in the context of this uh, of offsets, if you had a scenario where you're crediting for avoided electricity emissions, you have a scenario where um, you're giving additional allowances to an electric electric generator, um, but then you would also be um, avoiding the need for allowances at the margin because there would be more renewable energy generation taking place in the market. Uh, so you're providing another allowance at the same time that you're freeing up a conventional REGI allowance. Um, and there's a, there's a, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one double counting issue, but there is a double counting issue involved. Um, so we felt that it was it, it, uh, a key criteria needed to be that we're dealing with emission reductions in the context of offsets that are outside of the capped sector. Otherwise, you run the risk of those... Uh, uh, interactions uh, and potential double counting. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Chris. I, it's uh, it's now four o'clock, so that that'll be our last question that we'll take. Want to take the opportunity to thank Chris Sherry. Thanks very much, Chris, for stepping out of your meeting to be with us today. And uh, I know the participants greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, and I just would like to remind everyone who's on the call next week's uh, in continuation of this series next Tuesday this. Next one will begin at 11.30 a.m. Pacific, so 2.30 Eastern, and it'll cover design elements in federal cap-and-trade proposals, and we're very pleased to have, have uh, gotten com confirmed David McIntosh from Senator Lieberman's office and Sue Sheridan from the Energy and Commerce Committee staff uh, on the House side, and they're going to talk about uh, the ways that federal cap-and-trade proposals have addressed many of the questions that uh, you've heard about today. Judy Greenwald of the Pew Center will, will moderate that one, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for joining us. And thanks again, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye.